Welcome back to what I hope is the final installment in this Admiral 19A15 restoration series. Got the chassis working, got the cabinet refinished, now I'm starting to put it back together. Uh, doing a little test fit now to make sure everything goes back together properly. There was a splotch on the grill cloth, luckily with some Q-tips and warm water and a little bit of mild dish detergent I was able to pretty much get it all out. Just a little faint dark uh, darkness here and there but basically that is completely clean now and as far as the weird stretch marks and stuff that's just the way it is. This is glued down to a board everywhere except in the middle where there's a wire mesh behind it and then the speaker mounts from behind. So uh, I'm not going to attempt to peel this off of the backer board and glue it back down. From what I understand, these grill cloths are often damaged, so I'm lucky it's in the condition that it is. Not so much for the lens cover. Uh, no cracks or anything, but it's got some pretty significant scratches on the front, so I am going to endeavor to wet sand those out. Not surprisingly, it's in much better condition on the inside because, well... That's pretty well protected. It is dirty though, so I gotta clean that out too and then get that mounted, put the chassis back in, dig up the correct channel knob and then make all the final adjustments. For the wet sanding, I think I'll start out with 600 grit, then go 800, 1000, 1500, then 2000 if I got it, and then uh, I'll finish it up with Novus number two polish. Now I'm going back and making sure all the component dress leads are done well because some of these parts, like this cap and this cap, I had just tacked in while troubleshooting it to get it to work. Now I want to um, shorten up these leads, add some uh, insulated tubing where needed. Same with these divider resistors, I just had tacked them in to get the set working while experimenting with replacing that high voltage coil. Well, now that I know it's working, I want to uh, tighten that up. Also, I want to point out a production run change that's a little odd. So, in earlier revisions, this lug is unused. But on this one, I found a part here, which kind of made no sense to me, but I verified against some other later chassis revisions, and they also have this resistor, which is not on the SAM schematic. What is it? Well, one side's going to B+. Plus. The other side's going to this white wire that runs all the way over to pin 3 on the 6SL7, which also has a 3.3K resistor going to ground. What is that? That is one half of the vertical output tube, and originally it was grounded. So they broke that connection and put in a resistor to ground, a small resistor, and a large resistor going to B+. So that forms a voltage divider, so they're putting a slight positive bias on the cathode of one half of the triode on the vertical output tube. Don't know why. I'll uh, try to look through run production change notes and see if there's a reason. I'm guessing it improved the vertical oscillator stability or some such. Uh, at any rate, um, it seemed a little puzzling why they're running long wires all the way over just to put this one resistor in here. I guess they couldn't find anywhere over here to put it. Uh, otherwise, uh, i got all new electrolytics done in here, disconnected entirely of the can that was originally here. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, put some deoxid fader lube on all the controls. And uh, something I also like to do is on the outside, where they have these locking rings, I usually put a little light grease in there. Help the... Uh, shafts rotate a little better, do the same thing on the tuner, clean up some of these tuner contacts, um, and reinstall pitcher tube, and make sure the set is still working well, and then put the thing all back together. That is the plan. Um, this particular ladder, ladder revision has a vertical linearity control, earlier versions don't. So for the earlier version, there, there's nothing you can do for linearity except uh, put in some good tubes and re recap it. Uh, but generally these sets do have really good linearity because they're electrostatically deflected. So 
as long as you've got a good sawtooth waveform going to the deflection plates, you're going to get pretty good linearity. It's not perfect though. I noticed on this one, I probably if I swapped out the 6SL7 vertical tube, I might be able to improve it a little bit. It's a little bit squished at the bottom versus the top, but otherwise uh, this is really good and it's better than you typically see in a magnetically deflected set. So I think it is time to put this back in the cabinet. Uh, but before I do that, I'll touch on a few other things I did. I cleaned up the chassis a bit. Um, basically with some simple green wiped it down really good. And then in some areas where there had been some corrosion, like on the top of this tuner here, I smeared around some of this bow shield, which is paraffin wax basically. Uh, this is the best of the 7JP4s I had on hand. Uh, and I got the correct type shield in here, cleaned the corrosion off the spring clip. I uh, got the good tension on this band that secures it. And well, yeah, just basically did some cleaning, cleaned up all the tubes and uh, dressed everything up nice and neat down below. I will have to dig up uh, some correct knobs. This should have all a uh, set of four brown knobs on here. Um, I'll have to go through my stash, see what I can find. One other thing. Well, I got it out here. So, this is the 7JP4, the tested. So incredibly bad with the ion burn and just, just a mess. Uh, some of you had noted that there didn't appear to be any getter on it. That's true. And I had been supposing, well, that uh, some air had leaked into this and slowly ate it away. So that, that cup down there originally would have had some reactive metal in it. I forget exactly what they use. I think it's something like sodium or potassium that reacts really strongly with oxygen. idea being that any air that was left in here when they pull the vacuum and seal the tube off would get attracted to that reactive metal and um, not affect the tube performance. That's what you see on all kinds of vacuum tubes. That's what this splotches on top of all these miniature tubes. Well, I think that's a bad tube, so I'm not going to see it on that guy. Here we go. Here's a good example. So that's what that splotch is on the side of this tube. Well, it doesn't have one. Uh, normally, if it gets eaten away by air leaking in, it'd be pretty noticeable. But I do see a faint tinge on this one. So I think... Well, maybe it wasn't... Um, fired that well, or flashed, I should say, flash is the term, when they vaporize this, they put an RF and like, induction coil around it and heat it up, and it goes from that cup and spurt, uh, splats onto the side of the inside of the glass. Alright, so there's that. But I noticed something else about this. So I've said on a number of occasions that these tubes can't be rebuilt because of the glass, they used and the complexity of electron gun and deflection plates that it just wouldn't be cost per effective. However, there was one individual on an online forum who claimed that his was. And there was some pretty skeptical responses to it. But he had photos and well it's kinda hard to dispute him. Well, you know what? I think this one is a rebuilt 7JP4 as well. Why do I say that? Well, this is a pretty clear seam right here, and I can feel that the glass is bent all over. It's got a ring around it. It's not smooth. You can not see that uh, normally in a 7JP4. Here's another one. By way of comparison. See, there's nothing going on there. It's just one continuous smooth piece of glass. And let's see. Get around this one's a little goofy looking, but that's that rectangle square thing right there. But there's no line, there's no seam, there's no ripple in the glass or anything. What you see me see is the run one running down the side because they built these from two shells that were kind of welded together. 
So, I think this is rebuilt. Maybe not rebuilt very well. They didn't flash the getter. Maybe they didn't even use a getter. And, well, um, that would account for the poor performance and the ion burn and the weird seam on here and all that. So, perhaps it is possible to rebuild these after all. Who can say? I mean, all this stuff has been lost to history. All we can really do is speculate at this point, unless there's somebody still around out there who knows something about this. Um, certainly, if any of you do, please leave a comment. I'd almost forgotten there were two modifications I wanted to make to this chassis. Retrace blanking and DC restoration. Retrace blanking was often left out of these vintage sets because when the CRTs are really strong like this one is you really don't see them unless you do something like I just did and turn the contrast all the way down. Let's see these lines on here. On a weaker CRT that you're driving a bit harder to get a watchable image they become more noticeable or if you're receiving a weak signal. Those are pretty easy to get rid of by picking a signal off of the vertical circuit and blanking out the CRT during the retrace interval. The other is DC restoration, which I'll try to explain in a moment with some diagrams. Um, but what I'm hoping is the problem, I'm hoping to illustrate the problem. So what happens on lower cost sets that don't have this feature, you can get everything looking great on a certain bit of programming or a certain scene, like this vintage black and white programming, but then when we switch to something else, like a modern color commercial, it's going to look terrible. It's either going to be way too bright and washed out or really dim. So I will just keep recording until we get to a commercial break. So now we're at modern programming and it's looking pretty darn white and washed out. And look at that, how bright that is. Your fade is, is almost just completely white, whited out. So now I would have to go over to the set and adjust the contrast and cut the brightness down to get the image to look good. Ideally, if you have DC restoration, you wouldn't have to do that. So that is what we are going to attempt. Luckily somebody's already figured out the component values. And it's pretty simple to do. And the modification would work both in a uh, Admiral set and a vintage Motorola set. So I'm going to attempt to get this looking halfway decent on this. And then when we get back to the... Like I said, I can't even. I was hoping to get this halfway decent watchable, and then when we switch back to the black and white, it's going to look really bad. And basically this is just unwatchable now. That's okay. I basically had to back off the contrast a bit and, and cut the brightness down. It's still not so great. Let's see if I can explain this a little more clearly. What I've tried to depict here is a simplified video signal as it would appear after the detector. So video broadcast, the video information part, the picture is AM modulated. So it's very similar to an AM radio. You go like a super hat where you go, you have a local oscillator and a mixer and then your IF stages and a detector. And after the detector it'll look something like this. What this is is uh, each one of these squiggly parts is one scan line of the picture. 
and this is a horizontal synchronization pulse. So when this pulse comes in, it snaps the electron beam back over to the left side, and then it draws one line with the intensity varying as the level of this signal goes up and down until it gets to the end. Sync pulse shoots all the way back to the left, and then it starts drawing slowly left to right again. I'm simplifying this. I'm leaving out any color information and the vertical sync pulse. We're just looking at one scan line at a time. Alright, and I threw in some imaginary numbers here. Let's pretend that the sync pulse, the, the bottom tip of it is minus one volt and then the video information will vary between zero and one volt with zero being black level and one volt being uh, the white level. So if the signal was all the way up here, it would be a pure white line, all the way down here, uh, just black. In other words, the electron beam would be cut off. Alright, great. So what's the problem? The problem is, if you look at the schematic here and ignore this stuff down here, the problem is we've got a capacitor coupling that signal from the output of the video amp to the picture tube. Why would they do that? Because uh, this tube has a plate voltage of several hundred volts. And if it picked the signal off here when we went to the CRT cathode, it'd have a couple hundred volts on it or something like that. And that would um, not work. <laughs> this needs to be at a certain a bias level, which controls the um, intensity that, like this, would typically be connected to your brightness control, as they show down here. So, in other words, you strip away the DC info and just get your modulating or varying intensity going here and your DC level brightness is supplied by this control. Well, that's not so great because if you capacitively couple this signal you lose your DC bias info and the signal will tend to kind of float towards the middle. So imagine if it was a super bright scene and all the video info was really up near the one volt level, you go through that cap, it's going to kind of drift down to a, around half a volt. So the scene's going to end up looking gray. So you might go over and adjust your brightness control to artificially shift everything back up. Uh, great until you get to a dim scene where it's closer to the zero volt level and now you've artificially shifted everything so it's going to be looking more gray whereas it should be black. So what can we do about that? Well that's something called DC restoration. Which this set does not have and a lot of sets didn't have. Generally your lower cost sets didn't have. The idea is you use a sample and hold circuit the one thing you know is that the bottom of this sync pulse is uh, always going to be a fixed voltage, let's say minus one volt. So if you can grab this and somehow save it and then apply it after this is capacitively coupled and use it as a reference level, you can get things back where they should be. That's what this does. So they pick off a signal from the sync clipper stage, so that's, that's the sync pulse amplifying, filtering, shaping circuit. And I'll give you a quick version. Um, they use a diode to only, um, the diode will only conduct during the sync pulse, and it charges up this capacitor. Once we get past the sync pulse, the diode will stop conducting and that capacitor will hold its charge for the duration of the scan line and they use that to add to remember that offset in conjunction with the brightness. So you still do have a brightness control so you can still shift this whole thing up and down but at least now we've got some fixed reference info as well. Uh, this final amplifier circuit is virtually identical in both the Admiral and the Motorola VT71 type series. Um, so the new parts we need to add are the ones with the asterisk. So not too many. 
So here, th this peaking coil is existing, and this is a 0 0.047 microfarad coupling cathode going to the cathode. We've already got brightness control. So we are adding um, a resistor here to get this sync uh, pulse kind of isolated and filtered. So resistor, because I should mention too that the sync pulse is present here. Everything is coming through. So this isn't just video info here. The sync pulse is present here too. So this resistor and capacitor form a filter of sorts to uh, get that sync pulse. And then we add this diode, which is a Schottky diode, I do believe. You can't use a slow diode here, like a 1N4001. You need something that can switch pretty quick because this pulse is at almost 16 kilohertz and it's a pretty narrow pulse. So you need a a fast switching diode, but also one that can handle a bit of voltage. As you can see, we got 240 volts potentially on the cathode here. So we need to add in a resistor and a capacitor and another resistor and a diode and a half microfarad cap. So I think I ordered up a few of these diodes a while ago. I gotta dig through my stash and see if I can find them and then we'll wire in these new parts. Hopefully we can find somewhere in a terminal strip that uh, will be fairly convenient. Brightness control, we can strap the capacitor right across the existing arm. Uh, wiper and uh, ground. And this stuff, well, we'll have to see. Make it a little ugly, but we'll see what we can do. And um, I'm curious. I recall trying this ages ago in a VT71 Motorola side. I'm like, um, I can't remember exactly. It seemed to help, but I don't think I did it as uh, uh, I didn't really explore uh, exactly what difference it made. So this will be a good opportunity to uh, take another look at that. I just finished installing the clamper modification circuit. And yes, it's very ugly right now. I want to make sure it works before I do a neater job. Definitely a couple more terminals on one of these terminal strips would help a lot. The heart of the modifications take place in this area where there is a two terminal terminal strip. Uh, one side of it goes to the brightness control and the other side used to go to the cathode on the CRT. So that was the first step was to take that CRT cathode wire and remove it from the terminal strip. And on that terminal strip, uh, that's where the diode got installed. And the point, or the one half microfarad cap, rather than using an electrolytic, I used a plastic film cap. Why not? They're small enough. So that's what that guy is. And here's where we're picking off the signal uh, from the sync pulse. It's after the second peaking coil, a 10k resistor, 0.1 microfarad cap, and that feeds into the anode on that diode, which uh, I did have handy. But rather than a 4936, I used a 4937, which is exactly the same specs, only it's rated for a little bit higher voltage. So that should work out okay. So yes, we've got some parts hanging in mid-air. Um, uh, probably the best thing to do if I can would be to replace that terminal strip with one that's got a couple more terminals free on it. I don't have anything else. No, I should, uh, we've got one over here. Um, but this is a horizontal circuitry, and we got some high voltage over here. I kind of don't want to be tacking anything onto that terminal strip if I don't have to. Uh, I suppose another alternative is to make a little, a little circuit board and put all this stuff on there and then um, secure it in place. I don't know. But anyways, enough yammering. Let's see how this works. If it works. Okay, so back to some color programming.
I'd say this is a pretty successful modification. Well, I said it's not playing perfectly. We've got a little bit of ringing on the left side and occasional streaks, especially up near the top here. I'll see if I can clear those up by dressing leads more neatly and getting a test pattern generator back on it and uh, tweaking the controls. So right now the screen should not be this wide. The set actually has a rectangular mask on it and um, it should not be full width. There is a later version of this set that uses a double D mask where they did use the full width of the CRT but this particular model the screen should image should only be about that wide so I'm actually over scanning it and by shrinking everything and getting it within the visible area that may resolve the ringing I was seeing over here. One trick to do that if you can is to grab the mask or measure it and take a, uh, a marker and just sort of sketch out the visible area as it would be once it's inside the cabinet so you can make all the adjustments while you get it out of the cabinet and then when you slide it in you should be good to go. It's been playing great for a while now. Uh, moved around the leads a little bit and got rid of the interference. The only issue I occasionally see is some streaking, especially in commercials when there's some really harsh contrast, but that's pretty common in vintage TVs. Not really a whole lot you can do about that. Likewise, you may get some buzz in the audio sometimes when there's really harsh text on there, but uh, otherwise, um, I was going to put a retrace modif suppression modification in this, but I'm really not seeing the retrace lines unless I drive this thing to levels that you wouldn't like the contrast 100%, which you wouldn't do anyways because it makes the picture look terrible. So I don't think I'm going to bother. I think that is it. You know, there's something I want to mention too about these vintage TVs. There is kind of a point of diminishing return, especially on these lower cost sets where there's no point in killing yourself because uh, they were designed with some cost cutting features like the, the set does not have as wide a bandwidth as higher end sets so yeah I could add DC restoration to it that improves it a bit but at some point you hit design limitations uh, or in picture 2 limitations and so on and it's just it is what it is I mean like so like this this where there's black text on a white background, it gets a little bit funky. I don't know if there's really anything I can do about that, or why should I even bother? I mean, I'm not going to sit and watch this, watch like a full-length feature movie on this TV. Uh, it's going to be for demonstration purposes, basically. And yes, I do need to adjust the linearity a little bit. It's a little stretched out on the top. It's an interesting thing about this later modification. It does have a vertical linearity control. The earlier incarnations do not. So I uh, just adjusted it a bit, it's squished down the top somewhat. On uh, earlier versions, uh, about all you can do is swap out the 6SL7 tube. So here we went between some color commercials and black and white programming, and I have not had to adjust anything, and everything was perfectly watchable. That's exactly what I was trying to achieve with that DC restoration. Uh, uh, circuit so that was definitely a success definitely a worthwhile modification so I think it is finally time to slide this back into the cabinet and wrap this project up transportation just a minute you got to go uh, that's right Laura everything just works out I'll try to remember but I guess that's it Sasha. here's what I ended up doing I did not put a new terminal strip in. What I did was use some heavier wattage resistors that had thicker leads so they're pretty stiff and I just shortened them up and made a neat job of it and left them kind of floating in space. A couple reasons why. One, when I do modifications to sets 
I like to make it pretty obvious that I did something and I don't like to drill holes or make unreversible modifications. Kind of in the same thing of people who restore paintings when they touch them up. They intentionally use paints and techniques that are obvious to any conservator that somebody added it and it's easy to take the, the changes out. Not that this is going to be a museum any day or anything, I don't think, but anyways, that's that's my thinking. Um, this stuff could easily just be clipped out and put back to original, and there's not, it's not going to short to anything. This isn't going anywhere. So, that is that. Um, uh, when I was testing this, I noticed some interference on the screen, um, and I thought it might be because of this. Picking up some interference, but no, there was actually, uh, I caught some ozone, a whiff of it, from in this area. And, and I heard a little sizzle. I could not see an arc. I don't know exactly where it was coming from. I thought maybe it was a CRT base, or the wiring, or... I just, I cleaned up the area. I kind of moved things around a little bit. It's a real common problem with these electrostatic sets. Part of it can be tin whiskers in the potentiometer housing. They can develop some shorts, just dust getting attracted by the static at a high voltage can develop um, corona problems, sloppy work. Uh, whoever did this definitely hit the wires now and then and melted a little bit of the insulation. Uh, these wires all have high voltage in them, they go through the chassis. There's an O-ring grommet thing here that's rock hard that provides some insulation that may be breaking down. On the back side, there are four wires that are low voltage and they kind of group them off to the side and they go through a separate hole. All the ones on this side have high voltage and they go through that grommet. So when you're dressing the leads, kind of keep these uh, apart from each other. Um, so hopefully that, that took care of that. So I think we're done. I think we're done under here. Um, I'll fire this up again, make sure everything looks good, and then uh, start putting this back together. I have the chassis back in the cabinet now, and I was doing some adjustments and I noticed something. So right now it's on, but there's no image on the screen. It's because I have the brightness turned on and I have it tuned off channel. So we should just be getting static here. Alright, so the reason I did that is, well, let's go to the one channel I do have a signal on. And it looks terrible. To get a good image, I had to turn the brightness down quite a bit. So, somewhere is around there. And just to contrast a little. There we go, it's not so bad. Now, if I go to let's stabilize, I'm getting a terrible reception down here. Okay, so decent watchable image. Now, if I go back to static, we have nothing. And I have to turn the brightness up. So, at first I was puzzled and I thought there was something wrong with the picture tube and I actually swapped a different one in and it had exactly the same problem. Then I realized, oh, that's because we added DC restoration into the brightness circuit. So what did that do? They added a DC bias so it kind of shifted the optimal operating point of the brightness control. So when I'm receiving a station, it's locking onto the sync pulses in the video signal and shifting or adding a DC bias and adding it into the brightness control. When I go to static, there isn't any. Now I charged up a cap, it may take a little while to bleed off the charge. Um, so that's good, I mean, that's actually working the way it's supposed to. When I measured things inside the set, that's me turning the brightness down, by the way. So now it's dim, and if I go back to the broadcast channel, hey, now we have brightness. That's kind of cool. Uh, when I measured what's happening inside the set, 
when the brightness control is turned up high, it's actually putting too much or not enough negative bias on the grid and it's overdriving the CRT and it's conducting so much it's actually dragging the high voltage down so much so if I crank the brightness all the way up the high voltage drops from about five and a half thousand to three and a half thousand so well anyways mystery solved so I'm working on putting this in back in the cabinet now I hunted around and found some brown knobs this is from a console set I believe I salvaged it out of and these kind of come in two flavors sort of like milk chocolate and dark chocolate and this would be the dark chocolate version so it's not quite right I'm still hunting around I know I got a bag of them somewhere a lot of spare admiral knobs but so far I've only found the darker ones but all four of these should be the same lightish brown color uh, clean them up a little bit um, otherwise everything uh, is in the cabinet and uh, looking pretty good. Uh, one other thing I want to do that did not seem to be present on this cabinet when I got it is to uh, add some knob felts. It's basically a felt disc that goes behind the knob to protect the cabinet from when you're rotating the knob that the plastic doesn't dig into the finish. There's a little bit of a gap. Maybe a sixteenth of an inch between the back of the knob and the cabinet. But if the chassis slid back a little or somebody pushed really hard on the knob, it might very well dig into the finish. So uh, I bought these, um, I don't remember what vendor from exactly. Might need to trim them down a little bit. Or I might be lucky. These might actually be the perfect diameter for these. Let's, let's give it a try. I got a few of these waffle type knobs. I went through my stash and picked out two that are in the best condition. But even so, there's some scuffs. A little bit. These are fairly soft plastic. They are <clears throat> definitely not bake light. They're EBS plastic or something like that. So let's give one of these felts a try. Get them out of the bag. Okay. So that's all there is to it. And these knobs don't have any dots or anything, so they're knurled. It doesn't matter how you orient them. You just go. Yeah, it works out just fine. So there's a little bit of felt now between the uh, plastic and the cabinet. See some scuffs on the plastic. And that's one of the better ones I got. The, the plastic is pretty soft, so it scuffs easily. Uh, so well, that's the last thing I'm doing is trying to hunt down knobs and then once I figure out which ones I'm going to use, I'm going to clean them up better. Oh, and then there's the back. So this set did not come with a back, which is very typical of these sets. The backs are missing. I think out of the various, I think I have four or five Bakelite versions in various conditions and two wood versions. I think I might have one back that's in fair condition that I will use as a template to make backs for all of them out of basinite and uh, a drill press. They're not uh, all that complicated. So I may have uh, preserved that decal, but boy, <laughs> that blonde, uh, gold decal on blonde is really, really hard to see. And it makes me wonder, did they, did they originally figure they would need this plastic channel plate? Because behind this, it, remember, it was silkscreen with the channel members, and it says channel uh, sharp tuning below it. But maybe they realized uh, that the, the decals were so faint that uh, they had to go with the plastic channel plate. And that, you know, who knows? There's mysteries lost to time. Hey, old boss, I, I got to keep Ben alive. Even if he kills somebody. You better stop that. Nobody's going to get killed. Boy. Boy, we got to pay him back. Alright, so that was a pretty successful restoration. Hope you guys enjoyed this series on restoring an Admiral 19A15 Admiral 7 inch set from 1949. Roy, my name is Nettie Fry. I was convicted of a murder I didn't commit, just like your father. 
That evening when Janice went to the police, I had to run away. And for the same reason. 